Computer Science and Engineering Colloquia features accessible talks by leading computer scientists and computer engineers from across the region and around the world. It's my pleasure to introduce Ron Dreslinski, who uh, has built a number of chips in his years at Michigan. He's going to tell us about today. He's also built uh, among the first uh, 3D die stack DRAM chip that was built in the mo uh, modern process technology. And uh, I hope you find this talk in entertaining. And if you don't, he also has happens another passion of classic cars and owns a 1967 Ford Galaxy. So you can uh, ask him questions about that or ask, have him to fix your car afterwards. Uh, take it away. Yeah. So, you know, if you're used to your parents saying, come fix my uh, VCR, I get my parents, come fix the car. So, okay, today uh, I wanted to take the opportunity to talk a little bit about the research that I did as both a PhD student and as a postdoc. I have a wide range of different uh, things that I've worked on in the past, and I'll, I'll touch on that at the end of my talk, but today we're going to focus mainly on the material from my thesis, uh, thesis and postdoc work. So today's talk is going to be about energy efficient architectures, and I'm going to talk about two different techniques to really achieve some energy efficient designs. And energy efficiency is becoming important, not in just the traditional space that we're used to of, of small mobile devices, but across the stack. So if you take a look at you know, Department of Energy's Exascale program, they're trying to build a system that can achieve uh, exaflop of performance, or 10 to the 18th floating point operations per second. And the target power budget given by the government is 20 megawatts. So they want to power this entire system in a budget of 20 megawatts, leading to an efficiency target of 50 gigaflops per watt. To put that in perspective, on the left, I've shown the Titan supercomputer over here. And it, has, uh, it achieves about 17 petaflops of peak performance, but consumes 8.2 megawatts. So we need you know, an order of 10x improvement in performance, or 100x in performance, uh, within only a 2x increase in power. So we need uh, approaches to get energy efficiency at that scale. At the same time, DARPA has put forth this PERFECT program, which stands for the Power Efficiency Revolution for Embedded Computing Technologies, and is really targeted at high performance computing in military applications. So they're talking about embedded applications, embedding things into unmanned aerial vehicles or tanks. And they've set an even tighter power constraint of 75 gigaflops per watt. They don't need as much peak performance. They operate in about a kilowatt power budget, but they need a higher energy efficiency out of the system. At the same time, the traditional space of mobile phones has now diverged into additional areas where energy efficiency is important. For example, wearable computing, like the new Apple Watch, which apparently isn't available in the store tomorrow, but uh, you know, they're, they're becoming popular. They're clearly selling well. There's also the emerging Internet of Things devices. And then what I've pictured here on the bottom left is actually a chip that was or a set of chips that were designed uh, by a colleague at the University of Michigan, and it's a millimeter cubed sensor system. And so you can see it's sitting on the top of a head of a penny, and it's three stacked layers that have some you know, edge bonding going on, but it's got solar cells on the top there that are harvesting energy for the system. And so it's very important that their entire system runs within the kind of uh, solar cell energy provisioning and the small thin film battery that they put into the system. And so you can see from this that energy efficiency is important across you know, all layers of computation, um, but what's kind of changed? Why is it becoming more important as an architect and as a circuit designer to look at these things? So traditionally, we've been able to scale up generations from you know, teraflop to petaflop by relying heavily on uh, natural improvements from technology scaling. So with each generation of transistor, the transistors got smaller, took up less area, they had less capacitance, they could run faster, and if we decreased their supply voltage, we had a relatively constant power budget. But things have started to change. And so I'm going to try to limit the number of equations I show you today. There's only going to be one in the talk. It's here on the top. This is an equation for the energy density of a chip. And to make it even easier, we only need to look at the blue portion. That's kind of the dynamic energy, and that's what's dominant in the system. And you can see the energy density of a chip is proportional to the capacitance times the voltage squared over the area. And we've continued to scale the area and the gate capacitance of devices as we go with each technology node. But if you look in the plot here on the bottom, what I've plotted is from technology nodes from 250 nanometer down to 22, uh, the supply voltage in blue. And you can see that it started to stop scaling. It's stagnating in terms of voltage scaling, somewhere around the 130 or 90 nanometer node, which ultimately leads to an increase in energy density. 
So the power is not decreasing at the same rate that we're putting more transistors on the chip. And so we end up with this new dilemma that says, okay, we can put lots and lots more transistors on, on the chip, but we can't cool them all at the same time due to their thermal constraints and energy efficiency. And so today what I'm gonna do is talk about a couple of techniques to try to address this from, from an architectural and, and kind of chip building perspective. Uh, the first is 3D integration, so actually taking chips and in integrating a full system into almost one package, if you want to think of it in that direction. And the second is near-threshold computing. I'll then show you how we took those two designs, put them together into an interesting prototype chip that has 64 ARM Cortex-M3 cores on it. And I'll show you the, the design of that chip, uh, some of the prototype results that we got out of it. And then I'll show you how we are actually extending that research as part of my research scientists to attack that DARPA Perfect program, where we're trying to get 75 gigaflops per watt for unmanned aerial vehicles. And I'll finally conclude with a little bit of biographical information on the types of research I like to do. So let's first take a look at 3D integration. So we'll take a look at it from a high level at first. So if you look at a traditional system, as I pictured here on the left, you have one chip in your system that contains your cores and caches and uh, your second chip in the system which control, um, holds your main memory. Think DRAM in, in a traditional system. And the connection between these two chips is pin limited, so you have to get pins from one chip to the other. Those pins are clocked at high frequency uh, to get bandwidth between the two devices, and, high, and that uh, ultimately leads also to high power in the interconnect, and a longer latency as those traces go across motherboards and up through DIMMs. The idea of 3D integration is trying to bring these two chips together. Is there a way that I can take them from two separate chips in the system and package them on top of each other and find a way to actually communicate between the layers? Find something that can talk from one layer down to the next layer. And I'll show you how they actually do that in the next few slides. But from a high level, what does this give us? It gives us a high bandwidth, low latency interconnect. I get lots of ways to communicate up and down the stack and it's not going across the motherboard any, anymore. So I get a lot of bandwidth and low latency. It also affords me some additional opportunities, like mixing technology nodes. I can build my CPU and logic die in a logic optimized process, and I can build my DRAM in a DRAM optimized process, and then integrate them together. Rather than relying on something like embedded DRAM, where I take DRAM cells and put them into a logic process, and I lose some of their efficiency and ability to operate as well. You can also incorporate different layers. One, maybe you perhaps want an older technology node like 180 nanometers, which has lower leakage characteristics, or you want to put in some sort of analog devices uh, into your system. And uh, it, we first started looking at this back in 2005, 2006. We had a paper in ASPLOS that actually looked, what does this mean in terms of architectures? And having that high bandwidth, low latency connection between your cores, your core layer and the DRAM, uh, obviates the need for having an L2 cache. So the latency to DRAM is so low, you actually just go directly from your L1 cache to the L2 cache. So the latencies we see are on the order of 10 nanoseconds to get to the DRAM, and that's about the same latency as an L2 cache. So you can remove that L2 cache and put in more cores in the same space and get more throughput in the system. So at a high level, 3D integration is really trying to package the whole system into one chip and reduce the power of interconnecting the system together. I'm gonna to show you how 3D stacking actually occurs, or at least one of the ways that 3D stacking occurs. And so there's a number of different technologies coming from different companies, different styles, monolithic 3D integration, uh, 3D wafer stacking. I'm gonna show you the process that we use to actually tape out our chip. And so I'm gonna walk you through Tezeron's seven layer stacking process. So this is the way that we're gonna stack seven layers together. And so, um, the, the process is done first at a wafer to wafer level. So I'm gonna work on wafer level uh, systems. So before I take a whole wafer of chips and dice it up into small pieces, I'm gonna work with that large wafer. And so pictured here is two wafers, layer A and layer B. The first step is I do the kind of front end of line stuff. I put down my transistors in the system and then I insert a through silicon via. This little piece of metal extends down below the transistors and into the silicon. And this is gonna be the way that I communicate between layers. After I've put my through silicon via in, I go ahead and put my top layer of metallization, all my uh, metallization up, and expose my top layer. And so the first step of the 3D stacking process is actually called a face-to-face -face bond. And the way that's done is I'm going to take two wafers and I'm gonna flip one on top of the other. 
So I'm going to take their top layer metals and connect them through that connection. So I'm not using that through silicon via yet. I'm just touching together the top layer metals. And I'm going to push those together and get them to bond by uh, applying heat and pressure to the system. And so once I've flipped them on top of each other, I end up with a wafer stack that looks like this. I've designated the, the bond that is the face-to-face -face connection as F2F. So that's what I'll use throughout the talk to, to, to designate that. The next step is I need some way to communicate with the devices in the system. So I need some way to talk to it. There's no way right now for me to actually connect any metal to the, either side of these wafer stacks to talk to it. So I need to thin down one of the layers. And so what I do is I hold on to one of the wafers. In this case, we'll hold on to layer A. And I grind down the other layer to expose that through silicon via. And I'm going to expose that. I'm going to grind it down to about 12 microns in thickness. So it's a very thin layer. The reason I do the first step as a face-to-face -face bond is I need some way to actually hold on to the devices as I do the grind. If I had ground the wafers first, I would end up with two 12 micron wafers that are very flimsy and hard to put together. So I do it at a wafer level first, and then I have one big bulk piece to hold on to, in this case layer A, and grind the other down. Once I've gotten to this step, I go ahead and I put copper down to connect to those through silicon vias so that I can connect my layers together. The next step in the process is taking two of these wafer pairs. I'm going to bond them together with a back-to-back -to -back bond. So I'm going to take the back side of layer B on each side, and I'm going to do the same thing, flip them together to connect them as a back-to-back -back bond. And I end up with a system that has both a face-to-face -face bond between layers A and B and a back-to-back -back between the two B layers. And again, now I need some way to talk to the system. So I'm going to thin one of the layers. I'm going to thin layer A down to about 12 microns and expose its TSV, put the same copper metallization, and now comes a step where I want to integrate my DRAM into the system. So we use a Tezeron DRAM. The Tezeron DRAM is a three-layer stack. It has two DRAM bit cell layers and one control layer cell, which is actually built in a, a CMOS-style process. And those get bonded in a similar way, doing face-to-face -face and face-to-back bonding. And now when I want to connect them together, I actually run into a problem that the DRAM wafers, uh, are, the DRAM dies are a different size than my logic wafers. So if I were to do a wafer-to-wafer -wafer stack, I would end up with wasted area on both the, the left side and right side of the system when I did the wafer level. So instead, they rely on a die-to-wafer process. So they keep the DRAM in a wafer level, and they dice up this, these layers into just the, the dies that they need, and align them in a tray, and use solder balls to connect together the logic process to the, DRAM, the logic stack to the DRAM stack. And so once I've connected that together, I can wire bond onto the edge of my DRAM cells. And I still need some way to connect into the system to communicate. So there was a, before that was done, we had actually put in a, 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 a layer of copper tracing to allow those bond pads to actually connect up to the TSVs on the system. So this is a seven layer stacking process by Tezeron. I'll show you a couple of pictures of what it actually looks like. So here's a couple of cross sections I've, I've borrowed from Tezeron's website. Uh, the top picture here is uh, zoomed in a little further so you can see all of the kind of metallization and vias. It's of a two-layer stack. You can see the face-to-face -face bonds are these sections here with the large gold piece. And you can see the, the lower levels of metal and their vias running here. And you can see a through silicon via sticking up to the top, which has been ground down to. Uh, the bottom layer zooms out a bit more and we look at a three-way for stack. Here you can't make out the metallization and vias other than the top level metal bonds and then the through silicon vias that run down through the system. And you can see these TSVs and the ground down to connect to these TSVs. And the total thickness here is about 12 microns for that intermediate layer that's been ground down. So that's the process of 3D integration. Uh, let's take a, a step sideways and look at the other technology that I'm going to talk about today, near threshold computing. Now in order to do that, I'm going to walk you through a little bit of basics about transistor operation under different voltage regimes. And so I'm going to do that with a, a sequence of three slides that illustrate different operating regions. So the, the, the graphs you need to look at here on the left, I've plotted the energy per operation and the delay of transistors as I scale the voltage from nominal down to the threshold voltage, the dotted line, and then down to below the threshold voltage, almost towards zero. So this is out in super threshold. That's the threshold voltage and left. The top curve energy per operation is created uh, by uh, two factors. One is I decrease the supply voltage, my dynamic energy decreases. And then as I decrease the supply voltage, the delay is getting longer, so the amount of leakage I have is increasing. So I have one decreasing and one increasing, which ends up with this trough. 
and there's kind of this energy optimal point sitting there. So the first voltage operating region is really a super threshold region. That's a traditional region where we overdrive our gates by a large voltage. It gets us very fast transistors. We try to operate it kind of at the edge of what we uh, can expect in terms of lifetime. So we, we kind of set goals in terms of how much NBTI, oxide breakdown, different ways that the transistors may eventually fail over time. We push as far as we can in the lifetime that we're trying to get so we can get the most performance out of the system. And so I've normalized to, to the super threshold region, uh, performance as a metric, energy per operation, and power. And I'll show you how that scales as we move through system. Uh, the first interesting design point, and this has been looked at uh, for many years, is the idea of sub-threshold processing. So sub-threshold processing is trying to find that energy minimum point down here. And so there's been a lot of studies, uh, and my colleagues in Michigan spent quite some time defining where exactly that was and measuring it on lots of real systems. And in general, that point saves you about 12 to 16 X in terms of energy per operation, but it's about 500 to 1,000 times slower than per traditional system. So when you combine those together, it gives you huge power savings, something on the order of 5,000 X. So this is great for doing things like putting things in sensors where I'm energy harvesting and I have a very limited power budget, but it doesn't work well for that wide range of applications from you know, mobile handhelds all the way up to supercomputers. So we need something that gets us some of the gains in terms of energy efficiency, but doesn't give us such, uh, uh, such poor performance slowdown. And so we started looking at the near threshold region. We said, what if we back it off a little bit in terms of our, our aggressiveness, and instead target maybe a six to eight X improvement in energy efficiency, but at a spot where the trade-off in terms of delay is much more reasonable at 10 X. So that still gives us a 60 X power reduction in our system. Um, and a 6 to 8x energy reduction. And we can use architectural techniques to try to overcome uh, this performance loss, actually get it to be on par with, with regular systems. And so um, in the proceedings of the IEEE in 2010, we really laid out this kind of near threshold region. Uh, what are the challenges and opportunities that exist for near threshold computing? And uh, I'll walk through some of those here and explain uh, parts of the process. So um, <clears throat> in terms of near threshold computing, uh, several opportunities arise. There's possibilities to design new architectures to leverage the, the, uh, <clears throat> the properties of near when running at near threshold, and I'll walk through those today. You can also do things like optimize your process technology, design the transistors to actually run in the near threshold region, rather than taking transistors des designed to run in super threshold and scaling them down. And then there's also synergies with the earlier 3D integration. Uh, near threshold computing provides less power, so less thermal constraints. So stacking things on top of DRAM doesn't run into thermal considerations where the DRAM gets too hot and you have to refresh it too frequently. And it also allows us to have shorter interconnects to connect things together with low latency and low capacitance interconnects so we can save energy as well. Uh, at the same time, it doesn't come for free. There are challenges associated with them. The first is obviously the performance loss, that 10x loss in performance. And today what I'm gonna fo focus on is many core designs to improve parallelism uh, and techniques to do voltage boosting to improve single thread performance. There's also challenges with low voltage memory, trying to scale the supply voltage of the SRAM down. So you're pushing on you know, the V-min and you're worried about yield, you know, yield of SRAM at low voltages. And so in the paper, in the proceedings of the uh, IEEE, we lay out several new SRAM designs that can help with this and also talk about some of the robustness analysis that needs to be quantified at near threshold. I'm not gonna talk about that today. You can look in the, the article if you're more interested. And the final piece is dealing with variation. As I lower my supp supply voltage down towards the threshold voltage, I have to be able to uh, accommodate more variation. So if you imagine a traditional system, I have a, a threshold voltage and I'm overdriving by a large margin with my supply voltage, if I have ripples, LDIDT, in my supply voltage and it moves up and down, or if I have ra random doping fluctuations which move my threshold voltage up and down, there's still a large gap in between them, so it doesn't make much of an impact on timing. If I bring my operating voltage down lower and I start doing that same thing, there's a large difference in between my lowest and highest point, and so the variation becomes a higher impact, and we need to find circuits and architectures that deal with that. One of those is a technique that was designed at Michigan called Razor, um, and there's other types of ways of monitoring when failures are occurring in the chips and adjust. Other methods include uh, voltage margining or things. If you have control over the, the body, you can do adaptive body biasing to adjust the, the threshold voltage of the transistors. 
But to dig a little bit more into the performance loss, I want to kind of illustrate more pictorially for the people who, who want to visualize it in a different way, where performance loss is coming from and how these techniques that I talk about are actually going to regain performance. And so I've plotted here on the bottom right, again, that same curve that's dynamic and leakage energy leading to the kind of optimal uh, sub-threshold operating point. And then I'm going to walk through how that changes as I take advantage of different architectural pieces. And so plotted in the top left, I've got some piece of code that's running at full voltage. I've colored it in dark red because it's running at a very high uh, energy per operation. It's consuming uh, a lot of uh, energy. And we're going to set as our deadline, our target for completion is the dotted line where that one finishes. And we want to see, can we design a system that has the same performance but has better energy per operation? So the first technique is just to take that, that single core and scale it down to near threshold. And we take that 10x performance loss. And in fact, the curve here moves way out to the, to the right side of the screen. And you can see that it's very light pink because it gets you good energy efficiency, but it's very long in terms of its delay. So to try to overcome that, we're going to use traditional parallel architecture techniques. So just take that single core and put many of them down and divide the work. Now, the total number of operations I'm computing is still the same. So the total energy to do those operations, because I'm still at the same voltage, is the same. I've just divided it amongst cores. So the color pink stays the same. The power gains have shrunk because I'm running them in parallel. But the energy per operation gains are still, uh, still the same. Now, this is all well and good. But if you talk to anybody who's written parallel programs or looked at parallel architectures, nothing is ideal. right? you really end up with something that looks more like this. There's some piece of code that's working as the startup and the, the closing portions of your code to pull everything together. When you're running your code, you may run into, in this example, I've put a barrier where all instructions have to reach this point before they move forward. So some of the cores reach their barrier earlier and then stall doing no work until the final core catches up, in this case here. And what this does is it extends the total runtime. And so by extending this runtime, I'm actually, you can think of it as I'm adding more leakage into the system or that I'm not meeting my performance target. And so <clears throat> in addition to just the code portions that are adding to this, we also have energy that's being added into the system because we've added a new bus to interconnect our cores and we added coherence messages and we have communication delays as we pass things through. Um, and so the first simple technique is really just be less aggressive. So that's kind of what I talked about earlier. Uh, let's back off of our, our, our voltage scaling and move to a slightly higher voltage where we burn a little bit more energy per operation. Still not as bad as our original case, but we meet our timing deadline. And what that means is on the graph on the right, if you hold it as energy per original program operation, it shifts that curve up and to the right. And so it's moved that kind of energy optimal point somewhere above the threshold voltage. Now, this isn't the only technique we could use to improve performance. The other piece that I want to talk about is voltage boosting. So rather than improve everything by the same margin by upping the voltage, why not target the portions that are leading to this parallel overhead? So that portion at the beginning, at the end, and here in the middle that are kind of holding us up from getting our energy efficiency gains. And so if instead we boosted those cores to full voltage and got through them quickly, we can get back to the portion where we're gaining energy efficiency faster. And so this has the net effect of shifting that curve down and to the left a little bit. And so it was after the proceedings of the, I, uh, the IEEE article that we started studying this in more detail. And in IEEE Micro 13, we actually went through and ran a whole bunch of different uh, parallel applications from both the Department of Energy Exascale program, the proxy applications there, as well as the traditional splash and parsec benchmarks. And what I'm going to do is plot those. Yeah, there's a question. What's the overhead of changing the voltage per core? It depends on exactly how you design your voltage regulation. In our system, we go with a dual voltage rail system where we run two supply voltages throughout, and then there's header transistors at each core that picks which voltage rail it's on. And so that adds about an 18% overhead in terms of metallization on the power rails. And is having just two cores is sufficient for getting large gains across most of your retorts? Yeah, so we, we, we had some papers where we looked at this. Two voltages is sufficient for this type of design. You can get additional gains if you had more voltage choices or you went with on-chip voltage regulators or built the voltage regulators in a 3D stack. Uh, we didn't explore them here, but those are definitely opportunities. Okay. Um, 
where is near and near threshold. So we wanted to quantify exactly where it was for a lot of different applications. What I've plotted here is uh, on the left is a system without boosting and on the right is if I use voltage boosting. And then across technology nodes, the top dotted line is the nominal voltage. The bottom kind of pinkish red dotted line is a threshold voltage. And each of these blue lines is one of the parallel benchmarks or proxy applications that we ran. And you can see there's a couple of trends to take away from this uh, graph. One is that the optimal point in terms of energy efficiency tracks pretty well with the shape of the threshold voltage. And it runs about 100 to 200 millivolts above the threshold voltage. And it's really a function of the amount of parallel uh, work that is in the workload. So how parallel is it? What is the communication to computation ratio uh, in the system? So what does it mean for architects uh, so in t running a near threshold? And what changes? And so one of the things we started doing was looking at different you know, blocks within the system and running them at different voltage levels. And so the first thing we did is broke it apart into the core, the L1 cache, and the L2 cache in the system, and plotted their energy um, performance at different voltage levels. And so these are the plots that came out. And uh, the interesting thing we noticed is as the activity factor decreases, so we're not accessing the L2 cache very frequently, its leakage energy is more dominant than its dynamic energy. So it reaches its optimal voltage at a higher voltage level than the core. And the same thing with the L1. So we have the shift to the right. And if you translate those voltages into actual frequencies, which we've done uh, in these particular plots, uh, on the left side is across technology nodes, what is the optimal voltage for the core L1 and L2 in the system? And on the right, I've put them into the normalized frequency between them. You can see that we end up, when we, we go to the optimal point, you end up with a system where the core actually runs slower than your cache. Your L1 cache, in this case, optimally runs about three times the frequency of your core. Now, if you talk to an architect, they'll look at you and go, that seems a little strange. This is usually one of my critical paths for closing timing. It's particularly in an in-order core, that path through my cache is very critical and tightly coupled into my kind of core design. So as an architect, it leaves us some opportunity to say, if, if we can change that, if that's different, what do we do with our architecture? And so I've plotted here on the left a, a traditional architecture, which has a core and an L1 connected through some sort of interconnect in the system, whether it be a bus or a mesh or some sort of interconnect to the next uh, level of the memory. And the question is, what can we do if SRAM is run at a higher voltage and therefore higher frequency than the core? And the architecture we started exploring is a cluster-based architecture, where we bring four cores together to communicate to an, a single L1 cache. That L1 cache runs at four times the frequency of the cores. And then what we do is we clock the cores 90 degrees out of phase, so that each core is on a different edge of the cache's clock cycle. Therefore, each core sees a single cycle access to the L1, while the L1 is servicing multiple cores, so four cores. So what does this do for us in terms of architecture? Why is this a good idea? So if I you know, kind of zoom out and kind of look at the trade-offs, again, I've pictured a traditional system on the left and a clustered architecture on the right. The first interesting piece that happens is something called clustered sharing. If you look at the system on the left, if the first two CPUs wanted to communicate data, the first CPU would miss in its cache and then go out onto the bus. Let's assume it's a bus-based system. It would then snoop in each of the L1 caches and check the tags and do a tag lookup, find the data it wanted, and then return it back across the bus. All of this consumes a lot of energy as I'm looking things up in all of the tags of every core and the energy on the bus. If I were in a directory-based system, I'd go out to the bus, look something up in the directory, go to where the, the data actually is, fetch it, and move it back, all you know, consuming energy. In the system on the right, the first and second core are sharing the same cache. So their data is locally shared without it having to go out to the bus and expend that extra energy. At the same time, this leads to the first of the negatives in terms of trade-offs, and that's cluster conflict. That L1 cache is now a shared resource, so they're contending. It's possible to get two different cores that start evicting each other's data from the cache and causing performance degradation in the total system. So what we do with our architectures, we expose several performance counters to help with both of these situations. The first performance counter tracks which cores are sharing data with other cores in the system. So we can find the process that's running on those cores and let the OS know to migrate those together. So the OS can monitor those performance counters and migrate things that share data together. 
And then we also track how many evictions are caused and how much trashing is happening in the cache because of bad uh, management between two threads being placed on the same cluster. And we can let the OS then migrate away things that are uh, conflicting on data sharing there. Another, trade -off, uh, another kind of trade-off is that we've added a bus in the system. The, one on the, the system on the right now has a bus that's coupling my CPUs to L1. This bus is going to take up more energy to communicate across and add latency to actually talk to that L1. Now, this is particularly important because this bus is very frequently ac accessed as uh, compared to this bus, which is less frequently accessed. So I've saved energy from this clustered sharing, but I've added energy here. So it's kind of a trade-off. And 3D stacking is one place that's going to help us here. With 3D integration, we can put this connection in that face-to-face -face or that through silicon via connection. So it's running in the Z dimension, keeping those wires short and allowing a fast, wide interconnect in the system. And the final piece is that the L1 has to be clocked faster to support multiple cores. But we've already shown when you're operating in the near threshold region, you, the SRAM actually wants to run at a slightly higher voltage. So that's kind of offset by the NTC. Additional security concerns because these resources are being shared in new ways? Yeah, so the question was were there any additional security concerns uh, because of the shared resources? Isolation between cores or? Um, there's, you'd have to look at the TLB structure to understand when you're looking things up, your core ID would have to go into the TLB to be able to identify if you were allowed to access a particular address. So, in terms of? I mean, can I tell something about the computation running on my neighboring core because of its, like my cache behavior indicates something about its access path? Yes, yeah, so, so the, the question now is about timing. There's certainly been some research on cache side channel attacks, and I don't know uh, specifically about that. I'm guessing that there would be some leakage of information uh, with this style of design. A question on, on, in the traditional one, if you've got uh, coherency problems between the two level one caches, the Snoopy cache solves that problem. Here you've got, um, in one of your clusters, you have no coherency problem there. But what about, about across clusters? Um, yeah. You know, how do you make sure that you don't have stale data, and how do you avoid the overhead? Yeah, so the answer is, or the question was, and the system on the left, we traditional coherence helped us manage data on the system on the right. If I want to deal with uh, coherence between these two clusters, what happens? I rely on the traditional snooping bus-based coherence to get, you know, get data to keep it from remaining stale. So I keep this bus design still the same. I'm just accessing it less, less frequently because I can share the data locally. So I still keep the, the same bus protocol here. So I'm still doing the snooping. Okay, so let's take a look at how the boosting approach works. We've kind of talked about how the clustering approach works in our architecture, but this also helps with our boosting approach. So in a baseline system, I've kind of shown four cores running off of one L1 cache, and the cores uh, are, the cache is running four times the frequency. And I'll show you in, a, in the next few slides how I pipeline my cache to access the system. When I suddenly need single thread performance, when I hit one of those bottlenecks in my system, one of those barriers or locks or the startup code, what I can do is turn off some of the cores inside of my cluster, and that remaining core stays at its frequency and the cache stays where it's at, or the, the remaining core ups its voltage and frequency, the cache remains where it's at, and I get a 4x performance improvement in that single thread system. At the same time, that core also sees a larger cache space so it gets a little bit better performance out of the system. It does evict data from the other threads running on the system, and so there is some cold start and warm up that has to happen when they get turned back online. Uh, but we're trying to get through this thread quickly. Um, if that still isn't enough performance in the system, I can go ahead and boost it all the way to the full voltage for both systems and get an 8x performance improvement. Um, that larger cache also helps us offset the fact that DRAM looks further away to the faster core. Since the DRAM access latency remains the same, but the cycle time of the core gets shorter as I go to a higher frequency, it looks like more core cycles to access the DRAM. So a larger cache helps hide that, larger, that longer latency to DRAM. It's very unusual to think of cache being faster than core. Yes. Yeah. Nice job of explaining some things you can do to even out the trade-offs. But you didn't talk about revisiting you know, instructions. Usually, you know, because the core is so much faster, I can decode really complicated instructions and then eventually decide what to load. But here, maybe I should have simpler instructions and do more loading into more registers. Have you looked at those? 
trade-offs? So um, the question is related to looking at different trade-offs in terms of uh, instructions and other things. So I haven't looked at instructions and the decode latency in terms of trade-off. I have looked at when you look at SIMD or GP, GPU style architectures, uh, scatter gather operations. So when I have a vector load that goes to many different cache lines, I'm now, because my memory is running faster, able to scatter and gather the data from many different banks, even if there's bank conflicts, in shorter numbers of cycles. And so I can leverage that same technique there. But again, it comes back to the, the difference in memory timing and not so much running part of the pipeline at a faster frequency or slower frequency. Okay, I wanted to go through how we actually design the cache controller to manage these different operating modes. And so in terms of cache timing, on the left I've plotted here the NTC mode of the system. So this is when I have three or four cores in a cluster that are operating. My target is to achieve something that's very low power. And so the way I do that is I pipeline my cache into four stages. Remember, it's running four times as fast, so I want four pipeline stages. Uh, the first stage is a tag lookup. So I check in the tags of my cache to find out if I have a, uh, to get the tag values. I do a comparison on the second cycle to find out which data array holds the data. On the third cycle, I access only the data array that contains the data, or if it's not in the cache, I can avoid the data array access altogether. And on the fourth cycle, I return my results. And so in this way, uh, we save a lot of energy by only accessing portions of our data array. When I go to the boosted mode, I'm more focused on low latency. So I need to transition to a mode where I don't have the, as many pipeline stages. So in fact, in our final design, we move to a two-stage pipeline system and clock our cache at twice the frequency of the core uh, when we're in boosted mode. Um, and in this case, we're focused on low latency, so we do the tag array and data array lookups in parallel. In this case, I access every way of the data cache, which consumes more energy. And on a second cycle, I compare my tags and mux out the correct result from the data array. I'm paying more energy to do that data array lookup, but I'm already in that single-threaded mode, which is higher voltage, and I'm trying to get single-threaded performance. So I'm willing to pay a little bit of energy and power so I can get back to the mode where I'm in near threshold and saving more energy. In terms of just kind of a timing diagram, this is the Cortex-M3 core that we designed and its timing diagram. The data becomes available here between the blue and green of the execute stage. You can see the cache clock moving at four times the frequency of the core clock. And you can see the four different stages as it's getting the data and then returning it well before the end of the memory stage when the data is necessary. <clears throat> you can also, each core would be in one of the different stages since they're 90 degrees out of phase. So each core would be doing one of the different pipeline stages. In two core mode, uh, we break it down as the tag and data and then tag compare, still meeting our timing diagram. So now that I've kind of explained near threshold computing, it's architecture that was uh, interesting architectures that came out of it and 3D integration, let me show you how we combine those together to build a prototype system called Centipede. Yep. There's some relationship between what you're doing and sort of dark silicon. You're kind of assuming you can power everything in comparisons, but you can't anymore. Okay, so the question was how, how does this compare to kind of dark silicon type system? So dark silicon is, the kind of the motivation behind this, this style of work. And if you look at uh, Michael Taylor, who's been doing a lot of work in the area, he defined four potential solutions to dark silicon. One is specialization, which is his research focus, creating small, different, specialized ASICs, and you only turn some of them on and run them at full voltage, so only portions of your chip are turned on at a time. The second is just the shrinking horseman, as he calls it. It's just you're going to smaller chips. The third is our technique called the dim horseman. It's keeping everything on, but running it at very low voltage. So it's just spreading out that energy across the chip. So it's kind of like a brownout condition in a city where everything's running kind of low. And then the final is, you know, the find some new technology to replace everything. So we, we are kind of in that dark silicon rain. And, and if you want to think of it, we're the dim silicon running very, very low lighting. Okay, so the centipede test chip. This is more of an artistic rendering borrowed from our floor planning. So uh, this is the actual kind of floor plan trace for our copper routes for our TSVs. Uh, but this is our four layer logic stack we designed at Michigan and this is the three layer DRAM stack that's there. Don't worry about reading the labels. Um, the key piece here is that there's clusters of four cores connected to caches directly below and then we've got all these systems. I'm gonna turn it on its side and walk you through some of the pieces of our system. 
So again, the centipede design that we came up with is a seven layer NTC system. So it's seven total layers, which I plotted here. The coloring scheme is the same as before in that 3D in, uh, integration talk. So I've got yellow, two blues, a yellow, and then three greens. And so I've got layers of cores and caches and then DRAM down here. Um, in reality, we sent this, we designed the entire seven layer stack, sent it out to get fabbed, and all we got back was a two layer system. So this is what we've actually measured. It's one core layer and one cache layer. It does test both the face-to-face -face bonding and we connect into our system through the TSVs that are here. So it does do the grinding and we do test the TSVs in the system. So it does show those pieces. It doesn't demonstrate, however, the uh, die to wafer stacking process, which is what we were hoping to kind of illustrate with some of our results. The system is broken down into clusters, like I showed you earlier, with four cores sharing a cache. There's uh, pairs of them throughout. They're Cortex-M3, so ARM cores, and there's 32 total clusters for 128 total uh, cores in the system. These pairs of clusters use 1,600 face-to-face -face vias to talk up and down between them, uh, between each core cluster pair. So that's that bus that we inserted between the cores and the cache. We also designed a bus system to interconnect the, the whole thing. It's clocked at 500 megahertz. Um, the latency to uh, run through the bus and get to the DRAM and get a result back is nine to 11 cycles. Nine cycles if the DRAM is an open page, 11 cycles if it's closed page. And that's at the 500 megahertz. At the core frequency, that's one to three core clock cycles. So it's very short latency from the core to actually get to DRAM and back because the core is running at a lower frequency and voltage. Uh, the system's built out of eight lanes, and then they're interconnected up and down on the left and right, and then there's one to get between the two halves. This sets our bisection bandwidth in the system. Um, each of the lanes is 1024 bits wide. And then finally, we connect up to the DDR system of uh, Tezeron. We've de designed our own DDR2 to, uh, controllers that talk the slightly modified version of DDR2 that Tezeron uses. Uh, there are eight different DDR2 controllers on independent channels, and they're each 128 bits wide. And we operated up to 500 megahertz, which is the timing closure that we could get on our DDR2 controller uh, in the technology node that we were in. Um, the DRAM itself could run up to 900 megahertz. We couldn't get our controller to go that fast. Our total system uh, interconnects. So again, face-to-face -face bonds. Here we have very high density of that top layer metal bonding. Our through silicon vias, uh, we run about 3,000 between this layer and about 3,600 3, between the DRAM and DDR interface. These counts are for signals only, so those are uh, actual signaling wires. Additional TSVs were used to put lots of power and ground pins up and down through the stack so we could avoid IR drop in our system. Uh, the system was taped out in 130 nanometer chartered technology, so those four layers were in 130 nanometer. The reason it's in an older technology node is that Tezeron is able to hold or handle wafers at 130 nanometers. When they move to 90 nanometers, they increase the wafer size, so their grinding equipment doesn't hold the wafers, so we're stuck in that uh, process technology. Each of the layers is about 12 and a half by 5 microns in size, and so the total device counts are kind of sitting there. Uh, just to illustrate that shortening of the interconnect between the caches and cores, this is a layout or just a block diagram of the, the actual layout of our caches. These are the different SRAM arrays for the tags and data of the I cache and D cache. Each were four-way associative. And then the controller that switches between the two modes is built as a sea of gates around the outside of it. And then these dots here are those face-to-face -face connections that are connecting between the core and cache uh, layers. If I look at the core layers, we have four cores circled around the outside, and then we have some clocking and control structures and boot structures to actually get our system to boot here in the middle portion of it. But you can see these same face-to-face -face connections. It's important, if I flip between these two, that those dots look like they're in the same place, because if they weren't, when we did the flip, we'd end up not connecting the two systems together. So if I pull it on, turn it on its side, those are those TSVs kind of running up and down. Now I stretched it out so you can see it. Um, but each of these wires is only 12 microns in length, and there were 1,600 of them, and each one of those wires saved about 600 to 1,000 microns uh, in routing. So we did the same floor plan, but put the cores and then built the cache uh, in the center and put the cores around the outside and looked at the routing congestion and then measured the total wire distance, and so that's where we got our, our routing savings. So that's drastically improving our energy area and uh, latency to connect to our cache in the system. 
So to show you a, a couple of results, here's what we tested again, that two-layer stack. Uh, it's slightly different process than before. Here we put down the blue layer, thin the, the yellow layer, and put aluminum pads here for us to wire bond to in our system. This is a dye photo of the system. So how many people here are familiar at looking at dye photos? A few people? So the first thing, if you're used to looking at dye photos, you're gonna look at this and it looks completely different than what you're used to. And the reason is that you're looking through the back of a core layer. Every time we look at dye photos, we're used to looking down from the top through all the metallization, which gives that kind of cool rainbow color, you know, different things as you see it and the light hits it. Here we're looking through the back of a thin piece of silicon. So you can barely make out what's happening. In fact, these kind of colored structures you're seeing are actually happening because of the difference in density of through silicon vias that we've placed in these different regions. So you can see the four core cluster, one of them here, it's slightly darker in the system. And then here's our DRAM and bus interface, which has a very high density of uh, pins running up and down the system. And on the edge, you can see the, where they put aluminum wire bond pads onto the TSVs for us so that we could wire bond to the system. So I won't spend a lot of time talking about all of the potential configurations, um, but if we focus on just the leftmost bar here where we have 64 cores at near threshold and the rightmost bar, which is our kind of high performance single thread mode where we take all 16 clusters and run them with one core, we can see that the power we're achieving is anywhere from 200 milliwatts up to 1.6 watts, uh, 1.8 watts in power. Um, and when we scaled the, you know, the performance down, uh, because we didn't have DRAM to back the system, we were limited in the number of applications we could run on the real system. Uh, we used dry stone as a, as a metric, um, and we achieve about 4,000 dry stone MIPS per watt, which compared to kind of the, the ARM cores in a traditional technology is about a 2.3x improvement in energy efficiency. Now, if you remember from earlier, I said we should see 6 to 8x. Uh, we track that down to the fact that in our system, we built in these tunable delay generators on our clock tree, worried about clock skew between layers as we ran a clock through a TSV. And to make them tunable, we just ran the clock through a chain of inverters and had tap points at different spots. Running a high frequency clock at high voltage through the string of inverters burns a lot of power. In fact, when we isolate it out, it burns almost all of the power here that's green, so our bus and DRAM controller. Since we didn't have any DRAM, we power gated our DRAM controller and it came down just slightly. Um, so in actuality, that's about half the power is burned in that kind of tunable clock tree. Uh, that makes it actually closer to four, four and a half X improvement in energy efficiency. And some of the rest of the energy efficiency is coming out of the voltage regulation uh, in the system. Yep. You worded that very carefully, not to overclaim, so to try to help you. Would you claim that you know this is the first time anyone's ever tried to do this, and if you're doing it for real at scale, everything else, you wouldn't need this tunable yes. delay. You'd get it right once, and you wouldn't burn any of that. Yeah. So when you design, yeah, when you design test chips, you build in structures to make sure they work no matter what. And the first time that anybody's done 3D. Are the, is Tezeron correct in their RC delays and their TSVs? So we put in the delay generator. It's something you wouldn't put in the commercial system. We unwisely did not put it on its own power rail so we could isolate it out in analysis. So we had to kind of, that's why we didn't claim that full claim because we can't say for certain we've eliminated all the power in the DDR controller and bus, but it's in that range, yes. But this is not something you would need in a commercial product. And then uh, just in terms of measured results, in terms of the performance that you can achieve out of the system and the efficiency, uh, I've picked four configurations here. This, the configurations are the number of cores in four core mode, three core, two core, one core. So this is all near threshold. This is nine at near threshold and one at sing high single thread performance. I've picked points that have about the same amount of power, which is in blue. So I'm trying to say, if you look at ISO power, you know, what can we get in terms of single thread performance, system power, and efficiency? So you see when we're near threshold, uh, we, we achieve good efficiency and uh, throughput, but our single thread performance is low. When we up our voltage, uh, we get better single thread performance, but we're trading off efficiency and throughput. And so it really allows you a configurable architecture to adjust for what your program actually needs at a particular given time, how much parallelism you can use, and how much throughput and efficiency you need. So I'll briefly wrap up uh, explaining how we took Centipede and have adapted it to the DARPA Perfect program uh, for unmanned aerial vehicles and a bit of my other research. 
To understand the DARPA Perfect program, uh, we're going to look at an application called Wide Angle Motion Imagery. So this is a UAV flying at high altitude over a city, taking uh, uh, one frame per second out of 1.8 gigapixel images, so really high resolution images. And then it takes a stream of those computations and it performs this computational pyramid. Now traditionally UAV does this very low level of the pyramid doing the pixel computation and the rest of this pyramid is done on the ground station. The goal of PERFECT is to do as much compute on board the UAV as possible to eliminate how much data needs to be transmitted to the ground. So as you move up the computational stack, the amount of data decreases. So you go from trillions of pixels into hundreds of threads. And so the smaller amount we can send out, the less likely the UAV is to be detected, intercepted, and the more UAVs I can put within the same amount of satellite bandwidth. So once I do the pixel level stuff, this is taking deep blur, noise calculations, things that are very regular uh, in terms of computation, running small windows of computations over pixels. It fits very well on SIMD or GPGPU style architectures. I'm doing the same operation on every pixel, so I can do the same instruction, and I don't have things like branches that cause branch divergence um, in my system. And it's a very small amount of compute. As I move up the stack and I start tracking objects, so I recognize the objects and I, this shows the different tracks that the objects have taken in my picture. I do that with an optical flow algorithm. Uh, here, the number of tracks is smaller, but the amount of compute I have to do is larger and it includes things like branch divergence. As I continue up, I can classify each of these tracks into events and then sets of events, I do some Bayesian network analysis to understand is there a particular threat happening? Is there an IED potentially on the side of the road type of information? So we retarget our architecture to add some things. Uh, Centipede is very good at handling, you know, in our single thread mode, the top of the pyramid. In near threshold mode, this kind of middle of the pyramid where we have branch divergence, we want something that's more efficient at the bottom of the, the pyramid. And so we augment the traditional system I showed you earlier where we had four cores showing an L1 to add some accelerators that are very energy efficient for common computations uh, like FFT. And then we add a throughput accelerator unit. In this case, it's a, it's a SIMT style system. So very much like a GPGPU without all the texture engine cruft. And we run that at near threshold, leverage the, the same scatter gather type information. We build that out in the system using a 3D crossbar design that we've uh, built and then into a larger system. Uh, in, in the end, we show at seven nanometers, which is the target, uh, using ITRS projections for seven nanometer, which are fairly aggressive in where we will be. It shows about 135 gigaflops per watt. Now I have to qualify this that this is peak performance. The perfect goal is sustained performance, uh, 75 gigaflops per watt. And it also wants a more realistic seven nanometer predictive technology model. So that will also bring it down. And it's also full system. So it includes DRAM and regulate, voltage regulation, which this number hasn't. So uh, when we bring all that in, this number comes down to about 50 gigaflops per watt. So we're still under the target, but we're working on improving it as part of phase two and three of that project. Uh, to give you a little background on my research, just to finalize, uh, I, type, I tend to work on exploring architectures, but also systems that are enabled by things that are happening at the circuits and device level. Um, here's uh, an example. These are some chips that I, I worked on taping out, which are high radix crossbars, so 64 inputs by 64 outputs by 128 bits that run at a gigahertz in terms of performance. And then studied how that builds out into a full system and how to build it into a 3D integrated system and improve and deal, deal with quality of service and, and control. Um, I also worked on per core voltage boosting, so techniques to actually change the voltage very quickly. Um, as part of my thesis, came up with some of the dual rail circuitry stuff. Uh, it was eventually implemented in a chip. I was busy on some other project at this time, so I didn't actually help with the tape out of this one, uh, but some people at Michigan did. And then we used that to actually study reducing tail latency in data centers. So if you can take a distribution of requests to like a web server or memcached, uh, if you use traditional DVFS, you shift the entire curve to the left by the same amount because you're changing the voltage frequency. Here we do the same targeting technique we talked about earlier. I only boost the queries ident I identify as likely to be in the tail, and so I can reduce the tail uh, of the distribution further. I've also worked uh, with uh, Luis Ceze actually on this top project, which was taking our 3D integration and some non-volatile memory storage and scaling that out into a very dense key value store system. Um, I also have worked on performance analysis of real systems. 
Here we've looked at studying uh, mobile processors, and this is a breakdown of how often the, the on-demand scheduler actually turns on cores inside of a mobile operating system. So you can see most of the time it's, there's no cores, it's, it's idle. Here there's one core, two core, and three and four cores are turned on for less than 4% of the time. So we're he heavily over-provisioning our mobile system. Um, and so that's some of the types of studies. I've also was a key developer on the memory system in GEM5, and we've correlated that against real hardware to make sure that the simulator is accurate at least at one point of operation. More recently, I've been working on uh, intelligent personal assistant workloads and machine learning workloads. So we developed an open-end, along with some colleagues at Michigan, an open-end uh, open -end IPA like Siri that augmented it with image matching. Um, and did some studies on total cost of ownership. We also looked at creating DNN, deep neural networks, as a service on GPGPUs and data centers and how to actually make that uh, efficient, and that'll appear at ISCA coming up this year. And finally, I do a lot of research on wireless baseband processing. We've created an open source uh, LTE benchmark that does uplink and downlink on the transmit and receive side. We've converted all that code from MATLAB to C and into CUDA, so we can explore things like running LTE on GPGPU enabled systems. Uh, how efficient are they at that? So to kind of conclude, today I talked about near threshold computing. It's a, a technique to really improve energy efficiency across the different layers of computing, from high performance compute down to wearable devices, achieving significant energy efficiency gains. And we talked about voltage boosting to help with single threaded performance in those workloads. And then we showed how we built that out into a large scale 3D stacked system that has 64 Cortex-M3s on it. We're still waiting on the 128 cores in DRAM. I'm not holding my breath, it's been three years, and it's continually been three months away whenever we ask, uh, but maybe I'll get lucky. And then finally, that chip illustrated how 3D stacking and NTC fit well together. So I'd have to, at the end here, at least acknowledge this has been supported by a lot of different people, including DARPA, Tezeron, the company who did our stacking, ARM, and the National Science Foundation. So thank you. So we have time for a couple of questions. So you worked on 3D stacking for a while now. Um, do you feel like it's the future and it's going to happen? And part two is, do you imagine yourself working on 3D stacking in the future, or are you going to run away from that as quickly as possible? <laughs> <laughs> the question was, I've worked on 3D for a while. Do I see that going anywhere in the future? And in, am I going to work on it personally or run away from it? Right? Um, I think 3D integration works well in the context of DRAM. At least now we're starting to see the hybrid memory cube uh, popping out. It works well there because they put redundant bits on each layer, so with every layer they add into the system, they actually improve their yield because it gives them more total redundant bits to choose from. One of the biggest problems with 3D integration is the yield problem. If I take two wafers and I have one bad die on each, but they're in different locations and I stack them, I now have two bad dies. When I deal with DRAM, if I have three bad bits and three bad bits and I stack them together, I've got more spares between them, and so I can recover. So it works well in that space. In terms of logic, we still have to worry about yield concerns, so it comes down to a total cost. Um, there is a move towards monolithic 3D integration, and um, I noticed Qualcomm put out a, a kind of statement that they're working with a 3D monolithic piece. There's some people at Stanford who've been working on it and, and at other locations. I think there's some interesting spots there. It does require transition materials. So 3D monolithic stacking is I put down transistors, my metallization, use a transition metal on the same wafer and then put more transistors down. So keep growing. Rather than taking two wafers and stacking, I just keep growing on top of the same wafer. And that's seen some higher volume production in the flash market already. I think there might be a future there. In terms of my personal research, um, I'm going to use some of the 3D integration to enable some of the research I'm looking at, but it's not going to be the major focus of my work moving forward. Typically, very small systems, as you might find a mobile device or something like that, where leakage is a bigger part of the equation. Yeah. You, know, you, look, you look over a period of runtime of you know, days or weeks, and the thing is low duty cycle. Um, do you have any ideas for mitigating leakage as we move into uh, small process geometry? Maybe yeah, so patients. the question is ways to deal with leakage at smaller process geometries. So at least FinFETs have helped a little bit in terms of leakage. They have a, a steeper subthreshold slope, which has helped some of the Dibble characteristics as we move towards FinFETs. But as we continue to scale them, leakage 
continues to be a problem. Um, some of the areas that are interesting for leakage are non-volatile memories as potential replacements uh, for DRAM or other memory in your system. That can help with some of the leakage characteristics at, at low voltage. Um, beyond that, I don't have any thoughts at the moment on solving leakage. No architectural ideas at this point. Yeah. There, there might be something fun with three pipe materials. I don't know. But. All right. Let's thank our speaker. Um.